when I was just backstage, I was looking at the Declaration of Independence, which I do quite regularly, make sure that I've got the, especially the introductory statements formulated properly. And the introductory statements, I won't quote them precisely, but they lay out a series of propositions. And then the first is that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that people are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that they're equal, and that government is to govern by, by the consent of individuals. And those are axiomatic statements, right? They're the sort of statements that you build a system from. You have to accept the statements first before you can build the system. It's analogous in some sense to Euclidean geometry, right? There's a set of axioms and you accept them and then you can build a system, but you have to accept the axioms. But you don't have to accept the axioms, that's the thing. And one of the things that's very much worth understanding is that the current culture war that we're embroiled in, which really has been going on for, in some ways, for thousands of years, but in other ways for more specifically political ways, I suppose, since the rise of Marxism about 150 years ago. It depends on how you analyze it, whether you think about it as political or psychological, because as a psychological phenomenon, it's much older. The, the proposition that those truths that are laid out in the Declaration of Independence are self-evident is no longer accepted by a large number of people let's say, in the intellectual academy. And I would say that's particularly true of the postmodernists. It's also true of the Marxists. And the postmodernists and the Marxists have united in a very strange manner because their philosophies are not really commensurate with one another. The postmodernists profess skepticism about meta-narratives, large-scale stories that perhaps might, might serve as uniting structures for people's own cognitive uh, contents, but also that unite groups of people across large swaths of territory. They profess skepticism about the validity of those narratives. And yet, well, the problem with that is it leaves you nowhere, because if you don't have a uniting narrative, a uniting story, a, uniting ethos, you don't have an explanation for your existence in the world and you don't have a direction. And that's not helpful because you can't live without an explanation for your existence in the world and a direction. Or if you do live under those conditions, you're bound to be miserable. And the reason you're bound to be miserable is because, and I would say that this is technically true, that almost all the positive emotion that you're going to experience in your life is a consequence of pursuing valuable goals. It's not a consequence of attaining them. It's a consequence of positing them, aiming at them, and then observing yourself moving towards them. And that the sense that accompanies that, and we know the neurobiology of this sense actually quite well, the sense of that is one of forward movement and engagement and meaning and accomplishment. It's something like that. Um, hope, that's another way of thinking about it. Um, and it's the antidote in some sense to the flip side of life, which is the fact that it's nasty, brutish, and short, uh, as Thomas Hobbes put it. And that's inalienable as well. There's no escape from the limitations and suffering of life. And so, in order for that not to become overwhelming, and then that can easily become overwhelming, and often does in people's lives, then you need a countervailing set of propositions that you can act out and embody to endow that limitation with worth. And that's a not a trivial problem. I was just debating, not really, um, Slavoj Žižek about a week ago, and two weeks ago maybe, and I was debating him because 
he had been advertised to me and many others as sort of the world's foremost Marxist scholar and it turned out that he really was not much of a Marxist at all and so I ended up criticizing the Communist Manifesto which deserves criticism and and then I expected him to defend it but he didn't and so that was <laughs> sort of interesting but nonplussing um, <laughs> but he said something very interesting during that debate and it, it came all of a sudden it came out of the blue you know and I think it was the most striking part of the entire discussion and, it, and it, this is a, just a strange segue but I'm, I'm trying I, I want to I need to discuss this because it struck me so hard and because I think it's such an important point I'd never thought about it before so he told me something I'd never thought about before at all he was talking about the Christian passion and he said that his sense was that the most important part of it was the, the scene let's say where Christ is crucified and cries out to God that he's been forsaken and he said look you think got to think about what that means I'm paraphrasing him he said that the suffering that characterizes individual human life is so intense that even if God himself deigns to undergo it, it will test his faith to the point where he will not believe in his own existence. And that's really something. And I thought, wow, that's such a brilliant, that's such a brilliant observation, is that because it's definitely the case, you know, if you if you if you interact with people in any manner that's the least bit below the surface you find out that most people are carrying a relatively heavy existential burden of one form or another you know I mean most people many people have a physical illness that they're dealing with or a mental illness that they're dealing with and if you're in a fortunate position where you're not dealing with either of those you probably have a family member that does and if you don't have either of those you will that's for sure <laughs> and and you know that's just one of many terrible catastrophes that are certain to visit you and that terrible catastrophe is a challenge to us in many ways it's, it's a challenge to us because it forces us to look deeply for a countervailing meaning that can make sense out of that and then maybe more than make sense out of it and and so I've been curious about whether or not that countervailing meaning exists. You know, the postmodernists, the first thing about them, especially the identity politics types, I never know really what to call this group of people because if I call them postmodern neo Marxists, then I'm accused of being alt right conspiracy theorists. And if, 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 I, if I call them collectivists, well, that's accurate in some sense, but not, not precisely. And, I could call them identity politics players, and that happens on the right and the left, but that's the basic rubric. I would say the uniting idea is that the individual is a fiction, in some sense, and the right level of analysis for society and the political scene and, and the economic scene is the group, right? Is who you are as an individual is, well, first of all, perhaps that's just an illusory category altogether but who you are is going to be defined essentially in terms of your group identity your gender your sex that's already 70 different things um, your your that'd be funny if it wasn't true um, your your uh, maybe your socioeconomic status your class that was the original Marxist definition of identity right because Marx believed that history was a war between two classes and that your fundamental being was established by your class identity um, or it's your ethnicity or your race those are two other fundamental group identities or it's some combination of them all which is intersectionality 